brethren, welcome to Sabbath services. And before we uh, go into today's message, can I ask everybody, do you know what today is? Today is the 21st day of counting. It's the seventh day of the third week. So we are now completed three of the seven weeks that lead towards Pentecost. And for those that were at the, uh, the High Day Festival, uh, you will remember why we count, the intention of counting, and the discipline that it gives us. So, if you still haven't taken one of the uh, one of the forms from the back of the from the back of the room, there's still a couple of Pentecost countdown forms left. Please do so, and it explains on there how we count and the intention that we count the seven Sabbaths to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, so that we know when the day of Pentecost is come. We have some visitors and that's always good to see. So what I'd like to do is just give a very brief introduction into this assembly. There are some things that uh, you may notice will be different from what you've experienced in a normal church. Firstly, we meet on the wrong day. Well, that's because the Bible tells us to. I'm a Bible literalist, so I will preach from the word of the Bible. I will preach the scripture as it's delivered. And today's message in my mind is one of the most exciting messages in the whole of scripture It's possibly one of the most important messages that we get from the bible and it is suppressed in the vast majority of churches so what you may hear today will be something that could shock you it could be something that many churches will regard as heretical some would suggest that it's blasphemous but i will show you from the scriptures Every word that we say today is true and comes directly from the word of Jehovah. What I would say to you is please don't believe anything I say to you today. All right? I've said this before and I'll say it again. If you believe me, at some stage you will go wrong. Prove all things. Listen to what I say and then prove it from the scriptures. If you haven't got a Bible from the back table, please take one. We'll go to the scriptures, we'll prove them from the Bible, but I don't want anybody to feel that they have been misled by me. I will give you the scriptures, it's up to you to understand them. If I have incorrectly spoken the word of Jehovah, then by all means take it up with me and, and challenge me on it, and we will review the scriptures and we'll review the interpretation thereof. If I have correctly interpreted the word of Jehovah and you still have a problem with it, then you need to take it up with him because it's the, it's the relationship that you have with him, not that you have with me or the word of Jehovah. So if you hear something today that you find difficult or challenging or offensive, but it's from the scripture, you need to take it up with Jehovah. Okay? You will hear that we use the sacred name. This is a Hebrew roots assembly. We accept the Hebrew roots of our faith. We use the sacred name as we best can. You'll, you'll already have heard us use the name Yehovah and Jehoshua. So those are, the from the studies we've done, those are the names that we that are proven through the scriptures to be the name of the Father and the Son. And at the end of the message, there is a time for questions, so please, if you have anything that we go through during this message that you are not comfortable with, make a note of it, and there's plenty of time afterwards for questions. Um, you'll see on the service sheet, you'll see that uh, it's, it's a slightly unusual structure. So basically the way the message runs is down one side and then from the bottom working up the other side. But we put all the scriptures up on the screen anyway, so you shouldn't get lost. So what I would like to do is start by going to our statement of understanding. And the message this week is called the Family of Jehovah. So what I would like to do is just read you the statement of understanding and we'll then turn to the scriptures and prove all of these statements in this document. So number three, the family of Jehovah. The scriptures reveal that Jehovah is a family with the father and the son. Jehovah offers mankind an intimate family relationship through the gift of eternal life, making it possible for us to become the sons of the mighty one through the sacrifice of his son Yehoshua. As his children we are the heirs of the universe and joint heirs with Yehoshua. So what does it mean the family of Yehovah? Well let's turn to the scriptures and let's understand what the scriptures actually tell us. So please start in the second epistle of John that's right towards the back of the Bible just before the book of Revelation. 
second epistle of John, and we will start in verse chapter 1 and verse 1. Second John, starting in verse 1. The elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from the mighty one, the Father, and from the Master, Yehoshua, the Messiah, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. So here we see in the scripture, the first part of this family has been defined. It tells us, grace be with you, mercy and peace from the mighty one, the Father, and from the Master, Yehoshua Messiah, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. So in the scripture, we're told that the first two members of this family are the Son and the Father. Yehoah is the Father, and Yehoshua the Son. Now this is not just known to us. Let's turn back to the Gospel of Luke. So we'll go to Luke chapter 4. And we'll find how widely known and understood this relationship is. Luke chapter 4, and we will start in verse 40. Luke 4, starting in verse 40. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Messiah, the Son of the Mighty One. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Messiah. So here we see the demons, as Yehoshua was casting out the demons, they were declaring his very relationship to the Father. They were declaring, Behold, the Son of the Mighty One, the Messiah. And as we saw, Yehoshua rebuked them because it was not the time in his earthly ministry for it to be revealed that he was in fact Messiah. But we see here, this relationship between Yehoah the Father, Yehoshua the Son, is known to those who follow the scripture, but also it's known in the heavenly realm. The demons and the angels know their relationship. So the family of Yehovah is already known in the heavenly realm. And it says, as you say, Thou art Messiah, the Son of the Mighty One. So we know here that in the heavenly realm as well as in the earthly realm, the relationship between Father and Son is already known. Let's turn to Luke 22 and look at another aspect of this relationship. Luke 22, so that's forward just a few pages in the scripture. And we'll start in verse 66. Luke 22, starting in verse 66. As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Messiah, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of the Mighty One. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of the Mighty One? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. So in that scripture, in verse 70, it said, Art thou then the Son of the Mighty One? And he said unto them, You say that, I am. And immediately after that, in verse 71, they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. This is the religious elite of the day. This is the Pharisees. And they were looking to condemn Jesus, to condemn Yehoshua, because he was a threat to their power. And this statement here, ye say that I am, when Yehoshua said it, he would have said it something like this, ye say that I am. Now remember from what we studied over the last few weeks, Yehoah said, I am the I am. When Moses was sent to the children of Israel, he said to them, 
Tell them the I am has sent you. This phrase, I am, is the immediate pronouncement of the name of Yehovah the Father. So in verse 26, 69 it says, Hereafter the Son of Man will sit at the right hand of the power of the Mighty One. And in verse 7 it says, ye, ye say, you say that I am. So they know who he is. They know he is the son of Jehovah. They know he is the Messiah. But because he is disrupting their political, earthly power, they wanted to get him out of the way. They wanted to destroy him so that they could hold on to their earthly power. And as soon as he said, I am, they condemned him and, and found him guilty of blasphemy. Because in their mind, he was blaspheming because he had equated himself to Jehovah. But we see here that Yehoshua is the son, Yehoshua is also the I am, he is of the nature of Yehovah. And if you remember the study we did last week, we showed exactly how Yehoshua declared himself to be equal with Yehovah. Now we can go right the way back to the beginning of scripture to understand that this relationship was in place right from the very beginning. So if we go to Genesis chapter 1, from almost the very first page in the Bible, we'll see another indication from scripture that shows us that there is this family relationship. Genesis 1, and we'll start in verse 26. Then the Mighty One said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fishes of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So the Mighty One created man in his own image. In the image of the Mighty One he created them. Male and female he created them. Then the Mighty One blessed them, and the Mighty One said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And the Mighty One said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to every creeping, everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then the Mighty One saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So right at the beginning of the creation event, just as Yehovah was creating man on the earth, we see this statement. And the Mighty One said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So even at the very beginning, there were at least two members of the family of the Mighty One. And as we studied from the scriptures, there was the Father and the Son. And these were pre-existent. And there is a reason for this. And we need to just review one of the statements we made last week. So let's turn back to the Gospel of John. And let's go to John chapter 3. This is a, a very, very well-known scripture. John 3. And we will just review how the Father and Son relationship first occurred. So John 3, and we will start in verse 10. Yehoshua answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, We speak what we know, and we testified what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I had told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For the Mighty One so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For the Mighty One did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
So we covered this last week, but we need to review it again to make sense of this week's message. For the Mighty One so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That word begotten tells us where Yehoshua came from. If you read the scripture, you'll read the genealogies in the Old Testament. You'll see that uh, King Ahaziah begets King Yohash, and Yohash begot Amaziah, and so it goes. So this begotting process means to be born of. It means to be the heir, the physical descendant, or the genetic descendant of the person who is doing the begotting. So in the spiritual realm, if Yehoshua was begotten of Yehovah, it means he was born of him. Now from what we've seen so far, there is no mother figure. So we need to understand where did Yehoshua come from? Well, if we imagine that Yehovah is eternal, omnipotent, omnipresent, he is infinite, he could not have procreated through the normal human method. But if you think about what we learned at school, when we learned about cellular reproduction, you've seen the pictures where one cell starts to form two, and then those two cells split and they, they become two cells. If Yehovah used this process, he would have ended up with two identical beings, both infinitely powerful, both infinite, both of the same mind. In fact, at the point that that second being was begotten from the first, they would be totally identical. They wouldn't know which was the father and which was the son. So you now have two equally powerful, equally connected, equally understanding but identical beings. And one of them assumed the role of the father, and the second one assumed the role of the son. And we, we see from the scriptures that we studied last week, Yehoshua chose to place himself subordinate to the father. The mighty one who we call the father, at the time when Yehoshua was begotten, they were both equal and identical. Yehovah assumed the role of the father. Yehoshua assumed the roles and responsibilities of the son. Okay, And it says in one of the scriptures we read last week, it says, Yehoshua did not consider it to be robbery to consider himself equal with Yehovah. So now we have two members of the God family, God the Father, God the Son, both equal, both identical, but they have assumed two different roles, a father role and a son role. Now there's a risk to that. What would have happened if at the very time this separation occurred, so you had these two infinitely powerful beings, and one of them suddenly decided, well actually I don't want to do it this way. I want to do it another way. At best, you would have had a complete stasis. The two would have locked each other up, and nothing further would have happened. Because they're both infinitely powerful, they would have just tied each other up, and nothing else in creation would have happened. So in my mind, there was a significant risk to Jehovah the Father in reproducing himself in this manner. And it's a risk he probably didn't want to take anymore. So we see that the more often this happened, the more likely there would have been that one of these offspring would have rebelled or would have challenged the, the plan, would have challenged the structure. And therefore, Yehovah only procreated or reproduced himself this one occasion. And, and we discussed last week why they needed to be a father and a son, because they both had different roles. But we see that Yehoshua was the begotten son. But there was a risk in doing that, and so for the rest of his family, Yehovah has a different way of doing business. Now if you think about Yehovah, we studied him a couple of weeks ago, he is a God of abundance. You think about the earth, you think about all of creation, the nature, the trees, the fields, think about all the different species of animals, the different varieties of flowers and fruits and herbs and everything that he produces. So do you think it's likely that Yehovah would be satisfied limiting his family to just two members for all of eternity? No, it's contrary to his nature. He is a God of abundance. He is a God of creation. He is a God of bountifulness. He would not deliberately limit his family to just two members. But what he's doing, he's filling his family using a different process. And for the rest of this study, we will understand how that process works, and indeed who are the children of Yehovah. Before we move on, I just want to refer you back to verse 14. I'm not sure if we put it up here. No. Verse 14, if you look in your scriptures, just have a look at verse 14. Now this is a slight aside, but it's worth pointing out. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Okay? Now if you remember from the story of the Exodus, when the children of Israel were plagued with fiery serpents, Moses made a bronze serpent which he lifted up on his staff. Anybody who'd been bitten by the fiery serpent, when they looked upon the bronze serpent, they were saved, they were miraculously healed. And that serpent, we see an image today. If you look at a doctor's insignia, if you look at a military person, a doctor or a dentist or a medic, they have that same insignia, the single staff with the snake wrapped around it. That's become the insignia of the, insignia of the medical profession. That is how Yehoshua was attached to the stake. Okay? The Romans used the stake for execution purposes all over the world. It was, it was a very common form of execution. In fact, it was the most common and most brutal form of execution. They would not have spent the effort to make complex mortise and tenon joints, to make T-frames and to make the cross as we are seen. The cross is a pagan symbol that was introduced during the Council of Nicaea. There's medical research been done that said the, the physical body, if you nail somebody through the hands, the weight of the chest actually pulls the body forward and it tears the hands off the nail. So you can't physically nail somebody in that position. So there's all sorts of theories that, well, they were nailed through the wrist or they were nailed through the hands, but then they were tied under the shoulders. All sorts of different theories to try and prove that the cross was the correct form of execution. If you read the Greek, the word that we have translated in our English New Testaments for cross from the Greek is the word storos. The Greek word storos means a stake, an upright stake. So Yehoshua was executed with his hands above his head and he was physically wrapped around the stake and nailed at the hands and nailed at the feet. And the friction of his body around that stake was what stopped him sliding down. Okay? So when we look to the cross, you are looking to a symbol of sun worship which Emperor Constantine introduced. When we look, when the scripture tells us explicitly, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So he even tells us the form of his execution and the symbol that we should be looking to. So the cross is a pagan symbol that's been absorbed within the Christian church. Okay, so that was an aside. So now back to the, to the core of the message. Let's turn over to uh, the first epistle of John. So it's right back towards the end of the scripture, almost where we started from. 1 John chapter 3 and we'll start in verse 1. 1 John 3, starting in verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of the Mighty One. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of the Mighty One, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. So the Apostle John tells us very clearly, we, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of the Mighty One. He is calling his children now. Those who have accepted his calling, he is calling us his children, his sons and his daughters. And it says, Beloved, now we, now are we the sons of the Mighty One. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. And so if you think about it, and it says in Corinthians, at the final trump, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed, and we shall rise up in the clouds to meet Yehoshua at his return. What he is saying here is at the resurrection, when Yehoshua returns, those who have died in the faith will be resurrected into their spirit form, and those who are still alive on the earth will be transfigured into spirit beings to meet him to become children of the living God. We will become just as Yehoshua now is. That is what the scripture tells us. Let's turn back to Luke and let's look at another example. This is hard for many people to accept because it's so different from traditional teaching. But let's look at another scripture that reiterates this point. Luke chapter 20. And we'll start in verse 34. Luke 
Luke 20, starting in verse 34. Yehoshua answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die any more, for they are equal to angels and are sons of the Mighty One, being sons of the Resurrection. But even Moses showed in the burning bush, bush passage that the dead are raised, and when he called Yehovah the Mighty One of Abraham, the Mighty One of Isaac, and the Mighty One of Jacob, for he is not the Mighty One of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. But after that, they dare not question him any more. So in verse 36, it says, For they cannot die any more. So this is obviously after the resurrection. The, the physical body must die, but after the resurrection, it says, They are equal to angels and are sons of the Mighty One, being sons of the resurrection. Now that statement, equal to angels, is in fact a mistranslation, okay? If we look at the Strong's number for the word angels there, oh sorry, for equal to angels, that phrase, equal to angels, has Strong's number G2465. And in Greek, it's isagelos. And that is formed of two words, G2470 in the Greek isos, and G32, agelos. So isagelos means like the angels. But that word isos means like in quantity or quality. Now you've come across this word when you're at school. When you did geometry at school, you studied triangles and you had equilateral triangles and you had irregular triangles. Well, one of the types of triangles that you had was the isosceles triangle. And that's the word there, isos or isosos. And that means to be like in quantity or quality. So when it says up here, we are equal to the angels, that's not a true statement because it tells us elsewhere that the angels are ministering servants created for us. So what it says is we are similar or we are like in quality, like in quality to the angels. What are the angels? They're spirit beings. What does this say? We will be spirit beings and the sons of God sons of the resurrection. So again, he's telling us, after the resurrection, we will come up in spirit form and be sons of God. There's another scripture. We recently did a, an in-depth study. Let's turn back to the Gospel of Matthew. And let's go to Matthew chapter 5. And we'll start in verse 1. Matthew 5, and we'll start in verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Mighty One. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of the Mighty One. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we saw there, and these are in, in my Bible, which is what's known as a red letter Bible. So the words of Yehoshua are shown in red letters, and I think, I think most of the Bibles we have in the assembly are red letter Bibles. We see in Yehoshua's very own words, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of the Mighty One. Now this is not some man-made doctrine. This is not something that Paul or John or Timothy or anybody after the death of Yehoshua came up with to, to motivate the church. These are the very words of Yehoshua. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of the Mighty One. Okay? This is not a man-made doctrine. This is a direct statement from the Son of the Mighty One. Yehoshua himself makes this statement. And there's one more. Let's look at Galatians 3. And this is obviously written by Paul, who is known as the theologian of the New Testament, or the theologian of the New Church. And so Paul, again, gives us a very clear statement. Galatians 3, and we'll start in verse 19. What purpose, then, does the law serve? It was added because of transgression, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but the Mighty One is one. Is the law, then, against the promises of the Mighty One? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given that would have given life, truly, righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Yehoshua Messiah might be given to those who believe. But before, before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Messiah, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of, sons of the Mighty One, through faith in Messiah Yahushua. For as many of you were baptized into Messiah, have put on Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Messiah Yahushua. And if you are Messiahs, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Paul tells us here, you are all sons of the Mighty One through faith in Messiah, Yehoshua. You are sons of the Mighty One through faith in Yehoshua, Messiah. Our faith in Yehoshua, our faith in what he did for us, the fact that he came from his heavenly throne, took on carnal earthly form, chose to allow himself to be sacrificed because of the sins that we commit and then return from the grave to heaven to make the way of resurrection available to all those who have faith in him that is the ministry that is what Yehoshua did and up until this time the children of Israel never had that opportunity before the ministry of Yehoshua on the earth the blessing on Israel was purely a physical blessing. It is only through the sacrifice, the death, and the resurrection of Yehoshua that we now have a way to resurrection, that we can come into this relationship with Yehovah. And the symbolism, if you remember, at the time of his execution, it said when he was on the stake and he breathed his last, then the veil in the temple was torn in two. The symbolic act there was there was no longer a barrier of separation between man and Yehovah. When that veil was torn in two, Yehoshua, through his sacrifice, tore open the way for all of humanity to come into a personal and intimate relationship with Yehovah. But we need to be careful because there are certain things that we need to do. In verse 27 it says, For as many as you were baptized into Messiah have put on Messiah. That word baptized is not an English word. Okay? It's a Greek word. And the reason that the word was left in, when they made the King James Bible, the translators had a real problem. They were being paid by the crown to translate this Bible. This was to become the common Bible of the English people. And they were being paid to prepare a Bible that supported the Church of England doctrines. And one of the Church of England doctrines was infant baptism. And infant baptism is sprinkling of water on a baby's head. In the Greek, this word baptismo, or baptizo, which is the Strong's word G907, is defined as to dip repeatedly, to immerse or to submerge, to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean with water, to wash oneself. So baptism is to immerse. Okay? We know that when we come into that relationship with Yehovah, 
we need to be baptized. The infant baptism of sprinkling is not the intention. It says in scriptures, to enter into life you need to repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit, and then obey the commandments. That is the process that we're given. So if you've had infant sprinkling, if you've had baptism as an infant, you have not followed the biblical process. Because before you can be baptized, you need to repent. And if you haven't repented, your baptism is meaningless, because it's just a physical act. The symbolism of baptism is that the whole body is immersed in the water. The whole body is submerged, which symbolizes the death that Yahushua took. It says we, were, we, are, we are crucified with Messiah. Through our baptism, we raise from the watery grave. So we need to be baptized through immersion. And as we then immerse, all of the sins that we had up to that point are washed away. We are cleansed from our immersion. And then we are able to receive the Holy Spirit. And once we receive the Holy Spirit, with that Spirit working in us, we can then strive to be obedient to the commandments. Our carnal flesh physically cannot obey the commandments. It is too powerful for us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be obedient to the law. We can be a, a living example of the perfection of Yahushua if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. But we have to follow the process, and the process is we come to repentance. We go through the baptism of immersion, and then we receive the Holy Spirit. So again, if you haven't been, immer if you haven't been baptized by immersion, something you need to consider as you walk and you get closer to Yehovah, to fully receive the Ruach HaKodesh, to fully receive His Spirit, you need to be in prayerful contemplation, coming to repentance so that you will be made ready for baptism, true baptism, through immersion. So that talks about the children of Yehovah. But what is the purpose? What does Yehovah want these children of His to do? Well, if ever any of you have seen English television, there's a, an advert for Philadelphia cream cheese, which has a picture of this angel floating around on clouds with a halo, playing a harp, and all she seems to eat is Philadelphia cream cheese crackers. And that's supposedly heaven. Well, I mean, I like Philadelphia cream cheese, don't get me wrong. But can you imagine eating Philadelphia cream cheese crackers for the whole of eternity? It's going to wear a bit thin, OK? What is it when we go to heaven? What is our purpose? What is Yehovah creating us for? What is he giving us this opportunity to become his children? It's not just to float around on clouds. If you speak to most mainstream religions, they haven't really thought, what do we do after we go to heaven? Okay? The common answer is, we'll spend, eternally, uh, we'll spend eternity in the grace and glory of Yehovah. Well, what's the point? He can do that. He's got his angels to, to, have, to, to bask in him. He's got the, the elders around the throne. It says when the elders take off their crowns, all of the heavenly hosts fall in worship and adoration of Yehovah. What is the purpose for us? When we are resurrected as spirit beings, what is the purpose for us? Let's turn to the book of Romans, and we will study and understand what Yehovah is doing through this plan. Romans chapter 8 and we'll start in verse 12. Romans 8, starting in verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of the Mighty One, these are the sons of the Mighty One. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you, respe you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of the Mighty One, and if children, then heirs, heirs of the Mighty One, and joint heirs with Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of the Mighty One. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, 
but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of the mighty one. For we know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So brethren, what does the scripture tell us there? For as, as many as are led by the Spirit of the Mighty One, they are the sons of the Mighty One. We are led by the Ruach HaKodesh into that family relationship, into that perfect relationship. And in verse 15 it says, you have received the spirit of adoption. Now think about this. Human beings, and unless you're in California or somewhere weird, human beings do not adopt non-human children. Okay? You adopt people of your own, or you adopt human beings, you adopt human children, you adopt people who are of your species. Okay? Yehovah is saying he is going to adopt us. So doesn't that mean that we are going to be of the same manner, the same nature, the same being as Jehovah when we are adopted? And we then cry, Abba, Father. When we are adopted, we become full spirit members of the family of Jehovah. And look at this in verse 16. We are the children of the Mighty One. The Spirit itself bears witness. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit from Yehovah, bears witness with our spirit. We are the children of the Mighty One. That is the offer that is made. That is the calling he is giving us now. But now look at verse 17. Look at what our purpose is. And if children, then heirs, heirs of the Mighty One, and joint heirs with Messiah, What is Yehoshua? Where is Yehoshua now? He is sat at the right hand of Yehovah. It says in the scriptures that he can sit on the throne of Yehovah. And if we are an heir of the Mighty One and a joint heir with Messiah, a joint heir with Messiah, where can we sit? Where will we sit? If we are a joint heir, we have the same position. We have the same authority. We have the same place we will be entitled to sit on the very throne of Jehovah. We will be able to sit at his right hand. We will be able to administer his judgment, his creative authority, his power throughout creation, just as Jehoshua currently does. That is what it means to us as a joint heir in Messiah. And it says, even the, cre the expectation of the creature, the creation, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of the Mighty One. Even the creation is waiting for this family of Yehovah to be prepared, to be manifested, to be released into creation, to correct the wrongs. When Yehovah placed us in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they were commanded to tend the creation. Satan corrupted that. Satan took them away from that ministry. And since then, we've seen creation has been in decline. And now when we look at pollution, and we look at what's happening in our earth, and we look at the wars and the destruction, all of this is because of the corruption that Satan introduced into the creation. But the sons of the Mighty One, creation is groaning, waiting for the sons of the Mighty One to be revealed, to be manifested, to take their place, so that we can then work as the children of Yehovah to recreate this physical creation, to turn the whole world into the Garden of Eden. So that then when the world is ready, then the full resurrection of those who are coming up at the second resurrection can come into that perfect creation. So he has a plan for us, and it's not just to sit around in clouds and float around, it's to work with authority, with power, as creative beings to create or to recreate and repair this creation. And at some stage in the future, we're going to be recreating and populating the entire universe. Why do you think God would make billions and billions of planets and stars and just leave them barren? 
He's leaving them there for us in our creative manner to, to explore this creative power that he's given us, the creative potential. So we can go as his children throughout the universe, bringing his love and his creation to all of the universe. But we still have to be revealed. We still have to be manifest. And that is a little while away. Let's turn to Revelations 3. And let's continue to understand this concept. This, this concept of being joint heirs with Messiah is a challenge for many, many people. So let's just make sure that we are not misinterpreting Scripture. Let us make sure that the words we are reading, we are correctly dividing and interpreting. So Revelation 3, and we will start in verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of the Mighty One. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Brethren, these are words written in red. These are, to the best of our understanding, the very words of Yehoshua, the Son of the Mighty One. And in verse 21 he says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I also came and sat down with my father on his throne. Yehoshua sits on the throne of Yehovah. That is his throne. He's sharing that throne with his father. And he is giving us permission to sit on the throne of Yehovah as children of Yehovah, as full members of that spirit family, masters of the universe, masters of creation. That is our destiny if we choose to accept it. Now let me ask you a question. Who knows what we find in Exodus chapter 20? Frankie? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, absolutely. So let's just look at the first two commandments. I am Yehoah, the Mighty One, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's number one. Number two, and pay it, but note this, this in bold here. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Number two. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Yehovah, thy mighty one, am a jealous mighty one, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Again, notice that this boldened. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Remember those two points, okay? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them. And now let's look back to Revelation chapter 3. And this time we'll go to verse 7. Revelation 3 and we'll start in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is Kadosh, he who is true, 
He who has the key of David. He who opens the door and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my mighty one, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my mighty one, and the name of the city of my mighty one, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my mighty one, and I shall write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Yehoshua was the Lamb of the Mighty One. He was the perfect sacrifice. Now for him to be perfect, he must have lived a sinless life. So is it possible that Yehoshua can commit blasphemy or to promote idol worship or to promote idolatry and still be sinless? No? So how do we answer this then? In verse 9 it says, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. What does the first commandment say? You shall have no other gods before me. And the second commandment, you shall not bow down nor worship them. But Yehoshua is saying, I will make them come and worship at your feet. How can that be? How can Yehoshua make this statement? If this is not true, he's a liar. If he's a liar, he's broken the commandments. If he's broken the commandments, he's not the perfect sacrifice. So if he's not lying and he makes this happen, is he not causing blasphemy? Is he not causing people to worship false gods? There is only one way that this scripture can be true and Yehoshua not be, not be sinning, not, not be causing a sin. The only way this scripture can be true is if the people who are being worshipped are themselves God. That is the only way that scripture can be true. Do you understand how important this message is? Do you understand what the scripture reveals to us? If we read the scripture, if we study the scripture, if we allow the Ruach HaKodesh to open our hearts and our minds, what the scripture says is our ultimate destiny is to become God, to be God, to sit on the throne with Yehovah our Father, to rule the universe and to be worshipped by those who come after us. That is the destiny for those who accept his calling now. That is what the scripture says. Let's look at one more scripture. Let's go to John 17. And we will start in verse 20. John 17, starting in verse 20. And again, these are the words of Yehoshua. These are not man-made doctrines, they're not theories, these are the explicit words of Yehoshua. John 17. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. For they all may be one in you, Father, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you give me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, 
The world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. So again, look at what Yehoshua says. The glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Remember, Shema Israel, Yehoah Echad. Yehoah is one. Yehoshua is one with Yehoah. And he is saying, I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, just as we are one. The ultimate destiny of humankind is to be Ahad, to be at one with Yehovah, to be with Yehovah, to be in Yehovah, to be Yehovah. That is our destiny. Now how do we rationalize that? How can we get our head around that? Well, there was a, a TV program many years ago, you probably, I mean, I assume everybody's heard of Star Trek. Yeah. About 10 years ago, there's all sorts of spin-off versions of Star Trek, and one of these spin-offs was called Deep Space Nine, okay? And in this Deep Space Nine series, one of the characters was called Odo, and he was supposedly an alien from another planet, he was a shapeshifter. But in one of these episodes, of course I was a geek, so I watched all the Star Trek and, you know, whatever I could. But in one of these episodes, it showed that Odo had gone back to his home planet, and all of the population of that planet actually lived as a sea. They were, they were dissolved into this single sea together. So they were all perfectly in harmony, perfectly connected, because they'd all dissolved and merged together in this sea. And when Odo went to this planet, he dissolved into that sea with them. He became at one with the rest of his people. And when it was time for him to go back, he then emerged out and reformed himself out of that sea. Now imagine if we are spirit beings. As spirit beings, we're not constrained by form. We know that when Yehoshua came back after his execution, he was able to walk through walls. He was both spirit and able to manifest as men. Remember he said he appeared in the middle of them. So as a spirit being, you are not constrained by physical shape. So as a spirit being, if Yehovah is infinite and we have the tiniest, tiniest piece of Yehovah in us, how much of that is inside us? Infinity. No matter how much you subdivide infinity, you always still have infinity. So after our resurrection, when we are one with them, we will have our own unique identity, we will have our individuality, but we will also be totally mixed and merged and totally at one with Yehovah totally at one with Yehoshua, just as they are. And if you think about how Yehovah and Yehoshua started life, remember it said they split apart, so you had two identical beings, both absolutely identical. One chose the role of the Father, the other chose the role of the Son, but they were still identical. When we, are, when we come to the point where we are at one, we are in them, and we are one with them, we will take on that perfection. We will be perfect members of that family, just as Yehovah and Yehoshua now are. That is our destiny. Now that is very different from what is taught in most churches. Most churches just have this vague concept, when you die you go to heaven, and you gaze forever on the face of God and it's all happy smiley. That is not our destiny. Now let me ask you this, if this message is true, and as I said at the beginning, if I have misquoted the scripture, then show me. Show me where I have misquoted the scripture. And if I haven't misquoted the scripture, and you have a problem with this message, then the problem's not between me and you, the problem's between you and him. Okay? Because this is so new, this is so challenging, this is so contrary to what you've been taught in mainstream churches. But why do you think this message, why do you think a message so powerful and so important as this, the ultimate destiny of humankind, why do you think this message is not preached in every church, every Sunday, every day when people come to when Christian people come together to pray, why is this message not heralded from every church, from every pew, from every prayer group, from every Bible study? Why is this message not out there? It's because the purpose of modern church is to control the people. 
Okay, you think about it. When the Holy Roman Empire came into being in the fourth century, it's the first time the state and the church came together as a single entity. Under Emperor Constantine, he was the Caesar. He was the, the Emperor of Rome, and he was called Sol Invictus. He was supposedly the, the physical manifestation of the sun god on earth. Okay? But the Christians were getting uppity. They were getting difficult for the Roman Empire to control. So he negotiated a deal with the bishops. Okay? And they became, it became the Holy Roman Empire and the state and the church merged into a single political entity for the purpose of controlling the people. And that's how the Catholic Church has been since that time. Now if you think about it, if you have a church whose intent is to control the people, how much are the people going to listen if they realize they are potential gods in training? How much are they going to listen to the priests, to the presbyters, to the vicars, to those who would set themselves up over the members of the congregation who say, I have the ultimate authority. You do it my way or I will not accept your confession. And if I don't accept your confession, you're going to burn in hell for eternity. If the people truly understood that their ultimate destiny was to be Yehovah, do you think the men in the, in the white frocks would have the same authority and the same control over them? Absolutely not. Do you think somebody says, when I'm resurrected, I am going to be a God being, and he lets someone who's a paedophile, or a thief, or a liar, or whatever they are, give, have authority over them? Do you think somebody who knew the scriptures, who, who understood this message, would allow any man to claim authority over them? Of course they wouldn't. They said, oh, my relationship is with Yehovah. We studied last week, Yehovah the Father, Yehovah, Yehoshua the Son. Yehoshua is the mediator between the Father and all of humankind. We don't need vicars, we don't need priests, you don't need anybody between you and the Father. It's just your spirit and his spirit. That's all you need. And that is why this message has been suppressed for so long. It's to stop people realizing who they are to stop people realizing their ultimate destiny and as such it inhibits the whole of humanity from achieving what Yehovah has prepared for them. There's a, a, an excellent book by a chap called Viktor Frankl. Now Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychiatrist in, uh, just before the Second World War and he, he was a Jew so he ended up in Auschwitz and he survived and he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. It is a very, very powerful and a very moving book. But one of the statements he made is, when people lose the ability to love, they substitute power over. And if you look at humankind, you look at all of our elite and our leaders, there's no love, there's no compassion. All they want is power. They substitute power over the people instead of the love. And who is Yehovah? Yehovah is love. When we become one as he is, we become in our spirit form pure love. That is what Yehoshua is. He is pure love. His love for us is why he came to earth in his, in his carnal form to die on the stake so that he could make a way for us to go back to our Father. So brethren, this is possibly one of the most important messages that we will ever preach on the truth of the scripture, on our relationship with Yehovah. And do not be surprised if you are ridiculed when you speak of this, when people regard it as being heretical, when people say this is blasphemous, but this is what the scripture says. The ultimate destiny for everyone who is sat here today, should we choose it, is to become with Yehovah, a God, in a member of that family of the Godhead, a perfect, eternal, immortal, omnipotent being if we choose to accept the calling. So there's, that's one reason why this message is not preached. There's another reason. There is a spiritual reason why this message isn't preached, because there is someone who absolutely hates the fact that we have this opportunity. And I'm going to briefly touch on this now. In most mainstream churches, there's a doctrine called the Trinity Doctrine. Okay. And it's not a doctrine that we uphold as Bible literalists. We do not accept the Trinity doctrine. 
And most people don't fully understand what the Trinity doctrine states. Okay, so well, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three, yeah, it's something like that. Okay. The Trinity doctrine is more complex than that. And this is the this is the official doctrine, okay? There is in the divine being but one indivisible essence. In this one divine being, there are three persons, or individual subsistences, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The whole undivided essence of God belongs equally to each of three persons. The subsistence and operation of the three persons in the divine being is marked by a certain definite order. There are certain personal attributes by which the three persons are distinguished. The Church confesses the Trinity to be a mystery beyond the comprehension of man. Now does Jehovah say that he will give us information that is mysterious, that is beyond our comprehension? No, absolutely not. He says it is the glory of Jehovah to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search it out. The answers are there if we choose to study, to search them out. Who is the author of confusion? It is not Yehovah. So any time and say, it is beyond our comprehension, it is confusing, we don't need to know it, this comes from the adversary. And does this make sense? One indivisible essence, but three individual subsistences. An undivided essence, each of three persons. Okay? This makes no sense. If you wrote this and tried to present this as any sort of logic or rational argument, say, how can it be undivided and three individuals? It's not. You can't have that. If you think about the, the, what the scripture tells us, we have all our individuality. We are all spirit beings, and we can all come together in complete unity and oneness, but we start as individuals. We come with our individual learning, our individual background, but we become as one when we merge together. If you take the Trinity doctrine as, as wrote, we do not have a saviour. Under the law, the sacrifice must die. Now if Yehoshua was indivisible with the Godhead, did he truly die? Well, he can't have done. If, if he was indivisible and he then died, the whole Godhead would die. If Yehoshua didn't die, he wasn't the sacrifice. The sacrifice must die. So the Trinity fundamentally takes away the importance of the sacrifice of Yahushua. That's why it's beyond comprehension, because it's nonsense. It's not scriptural, and it makes no sense. But there is one who would choose to confuse us, because if you think about this, this perfect unity of the Godhead, what does it mean? This perfect Trinity is complete, and that cannot be added to. And if it can't be added to, does that mean that we can become the children of Yehovah? No, the family's complete. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Nothing added, nothing taken away. It denies our opportunity to become members of the God family. And there's a reason for this. Let's go back to the scriptures. And let's look at Ezekiel, chapter 28. Ezekiel 28, and we'll start in verse 11. Moreover, the word of Jehovah came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the master Jehovah, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of the mighty one. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the Kadosh mountain of the mighty one. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the days you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of the Mighty One, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, 
I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the trading, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the people are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. So who are we talking about here? Who is this king of Tyre? Who was in the Garden of Eden? What does the scripture tell us? There was God the Father. Well, there was God. We were told that God walked in, in the Garden. We were told that there was Adam. And we were told that there was Eve. There was one other being specifically referenced in the Garden of Eden. That was the serpent. Okay? And it says, here, he was, the, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Satan was a created being, just as all the angels were created. Okay, Satan was created by Yehovah. And that's one of the misunderstandings. People say that the spirit can neither be created nor destroyed. That's not true. Satan is a spirit being. He is, or he was, created. It says, you are the anointed cherub who covers. Now, if you remember last week, we, looked, we studied the word Messiah. Messiah comes from the Greek word anointing. Okay? Those who are anointed mean, if you are anointed, but as, the, as the scripture calls it, there is no higher earthly authority for your position. So the king of Israel was anointed, the prophets were anointed, and the high priest was anointed. The reason they were anointed was because there was no higher earthly authority to give them that position. Here we see that Lucifer, as he was, was the anointed cherub. Okay? There were three archangels, Lucifer, Gabriel, and Michael. Lucifer was the anointed cherub. He was the senior of the three archangels. He was the most powerful of the whole angelic realm. It said he was the cherub who covers. He was the angel who covered the throne of Yehovah. It says, you were perfect in your ways from the days you were created until iniquity was found in you. And then it says, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub. Satan is going to be destroyed by Yehovah. The time is not yet, but he will ultimately be destroyed. And when people think about the concept of the lake of fire, and say, well, you know, people who do not accept Jesus in this lifetime will burn forever in the lake of fire. Satan is going in the lake of fire, but it says here he will be destroyed. The lake of fire is the second death. It is the end of all consciousness and all being. It is not eternal punishment. That is not what the scripture says. I brought fire from your mist, it devoured you. Satan in the end of days will be destroyed. Okay? You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. This concept that spirit is immortal, spirit cannot be destroyed, is a false doctrine. The scripture is very clear. Satan, the devil himself, will be destroyed. Okay? Anyone who is thrown into the lake of fire will be destroyed. It's not permanent punishment, it is the end of physical uh, awareness. It's the end of that physical life. Okay? But why would Jehovah do this? He said he was the anointer. He was the most beautiful thing in the whole of creation. Why would Jehovah do that? Well, let's turn to the book of Isaiah and find out. Isaiah chapter 14. And we will start in verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above all the stars of the Mighty One. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. What did Satan say? I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of the Mighty One. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. I will be like the Most High. 
Satan, in his role as the chief of the archangels, took it upon himself to challenge God himself for his throne. Satan set himself up to usurp God himself from his throne. That is why the iniquity was found in him. That is why he was cast out, and that is why he will ultimately be destroyed. But if you notice, Satan is trying to force his way onto God's throne. What is the opportunity for us? Do we have to force our way onto the throne of God? No. As his children, he wants us to climb up there. He's saying, come and sit with me on my throne. As those who choose his calling now, our ultimate destiny is to sit on the throne of Jehovah, alongside him, ruling with him. Satan tried to usurp that position. Satan tried to take the throne of Jehovah, which is why he was cast out, which is why he will be destroyed, and why, brethren, he hates us more than anything else in creation. Satan hates those of us who are here on the Sabbath, keeping Torah, doing what Jehovah says, because he knows that every single one of us who makes it, every single one of us who it is adjudged for righteousness, who will be in the resurrection, becomes Jehovah. And we then have total authority, total control, and he serves us, and he hates that, which is why it is his intent to destroy all of humanity. And it's why, brethren, we must be able to hold fast to the truth of Jehovah, and as the scripture says, we must withstand the devil.